First question, how many laws are there in the Old Testament according to the Jewish tradition? Many. 613. That is correct. 613. <laughs> now, if, if you were to search your phone, Lou has his out. I don't know what's suspicious. But if you were to search your phone, you might find, uh, you might see somewhere that says 605. You might see somewhere that says 653. But the, the Jewish tradition accepts 613. So the, the debate around the numbers is, you know, as, as when you get into Leviticus and numbers, they're laying some out, and the question becomes, are, is this is this two different laws? Is this one law? Is of these that you're saying is three? Is it actually just one? So there's some debate, but the but the tradition says 613. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of laws. Yes. Why are the Israelites asked to build the tabernacle? To take care of the ark. Okay, so and they still build tabernacles on their porches. Okay, so the so I got mixed answers there. The Ark of the Covenant is where the tablets are, so that's the home for the tablets. Now the Ark itself uh, would typically sit in the tabernacle, but the tabernacle, the specific person place for the tabernacle is the place for God to reside on earth. That's the, that's the full and correct answer, if you will. That is where God would reside on earth. Remember, I talked to you about, um, about Eden and how at the fall, whoop, what's going on? At the fall, uh, humanity lost that opportunity, that ability to be present with God. Remember, they walked together, they talked together. You know the song. They were in perfect union, hanging out together. And we lost that. And so the tabernacle is the first step back towards that, where God resides on earth, not free and open as it was in the garden. Not everyone got to go in and be in the tabernacle and be in God's presence. And there was quite the ordeal around someone going and being in there. I've told you that it was once a year. The high priest got to go in. There were days of preparation for that. Uh, they would tie a rope around his ankle because the fear was that in the presence of God he would die. So they had a rope so they could pull him back out if that was in fact the case. Um, it was a whole, whole big thing, but it was once a year one person got to go in the tabernacle and be present with God. Now, in Exodus, who do we see spending a lot of time in God's presence in the tabernacle? Moses, that's right. So, so that that I just described is, is kind of much later on. Moses, um, Joshua spend ample time in God's presence. But. You know, I was wondering on Sunday when you were talking about he, Moses lived in Pharaoh's house. Did he have that scruffy clothing that he wore later that was filled with bugs? Uh, no, he would have dressed like everybody else in, uh, in Pharaoh's house. It would have been fine linens and, and so forth. Eight years later. Well, by that point, he, he, he would have been wearing uh, whatever the garment of, of the herdsman would have been. Yeah. So, at the altar where the Okay, so she asked me the question at the altar where we keep the what? The elements. The elements is at the tabernacle. Now, are you talking about the reserve sacrament? Or are you talking about? Yes. Would you? Okay, specifically, so the reserve sacrament. So yeah, we refer to it as an ombre. Some people, and this this again, this is not a right or wrong. Some people refer to that as a tabernacle. Um, in Christian thought, the, the idea of tabernacle, it doesn't fit real well with our theology. Our theology is that the Spirit resides with us, in us. It's, it's not restricted to a spot. Now, having said that, in our church we have a sanctuary, right? Now, you all probably don't realize this. Most, most people, most Episcopalians don't, but you all sit in the nave. You are not in the sanctuary. The sanctuary is only in the area behind the altar rail. 
where special people get to be, right? <laughs> uh, but that, that is, uh, the, the sanctuary is only that area behind. But having said that, uh, so the altar rail itself is an invention of the Middle Ages. I, I've told some of you this, you, you all didn't, hadn't heard this before, but prior to that, uh, well, for starters, people didn't receive communion regularly, so it was, wasn't a big deal, but when they did, they would, they would walk up and stand there. But in the Middle Ages, in those great cathedrals, particularly in the summer, uh, it would get very hot. And so like everybody did before there was air conditioning, they'd open the doors and the windows at night, let the cool air in, and then shut it in during the day. The problem was that people let their animals run free back then. Oh, yeah. And so they would come in in the morning and there would be poop and pee and everything up in the, you know, all in the nave and in the sanctuary. And people said, we've got to do something about this. Altar rails. They were actually gates to keep animals out is where they started. They have developed into a place that we come to kneel and, 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 and uh, receive communion. But that was not their initial purpose. <laughs> yeah, a root screen. Yeah. So that was a screen that would block part of the church off, so that was another way that that, that was sometimes done. You'll still see it in, in Europe. Uh, so those, the worship service, that usual worship service may happen out at an altar that's out of way, and then behind that's a root screen. And then the historic altar is back behind that and so uh, there were services for a long time that um, the people never saw it was happening back there behind this screen people were out in the in the nave they could hear it but they couldn't see it and when it was done you know they, they would come out and do a sermon but everything everything else happened out of sight and when it was done they'd come out and say go in peace okay see you know well, we kind of got off off on a tangent here, but uh, they one more tangent. One more tangent. Regardless of Indiana Jones, where is the physically Ark of the Covenant? Is there a physical Ark of the Covenant? Okay, so he said, where is the Ark of the Covenant? Is there an Ark of the Covenant? Um, we have no idea. Uh, is there one? Maybe. So we don't know the tablet. You said the tablets are in. In the Ark. Yes. Yeah, so. Where the tablets? So, part of what we're going to talk about tonight will address that, but. When Eli's son, you all remember Eli the high priest who Samuel goes to serve, his sons come along. They're out to battle. Uh, Israel is, um, has been unfaithful for quite a while. They go out to battle and they're losing. And they say, we're going to take the Ark of the Covenant out and that will drive our enemies back. No one can withstand. But uh, as, as the scripture reads, God had removed his blessing from them and the, and the Ark was taken and hadn't been seen since. We don't know where it ended up or what has happened to it. So, does it still exist somewhere? Perhaps. Perhaps. Alright. What were we on here? Uh, number three, how many sacrifices or offerings are there in the Old Testament? Seven. 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 Anybody else? Answer is five. Birth offerings, grain offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings. Okay. Now again, this is this is something that could be debatable. Somebody might debate, but that that is is typically what is recognized as five. Name one judge from the Old Testament. So this is a recycled question. Samson. Samson. Anybody have another? Deborah. Deborah. Judith? Judith. No. <laughs> no. Elijah. No. The, other, the only other one that I think you all might know would be Samuel. Okay. But Samson is, is certainly a, a, an acceptable answer. All right. Who do the Israelites ask for a king? So it was a kind of a confused question, but who, who specifically did they go to and say, we want a king? I am. It was Samuel. It was Samuel, and we're going to talk about that because that's an important, important moment. Okay, uh, name the first three kings of Israel. I think you all would get this one. Saul, David, Saul, David, 
Saul, David, Solomon. Who's the first one? Saul. Saul, David, Solomon. Solomon. That's correct. You know what? You said judge was who? Did you say Deborah? Deborah. Yes, Deborah is a judge. I apologize. Yes, Deborah is. That was correct. Name the two kingdoms during the divided kingdom. What are the two names of the kingdoms? Judah and Israel. That is correct. Judah and Israel. Uh, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Name the two tribes that form the southern kingdom. You already know one of them. Judah. <laughs> Second one. Benjamin. 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 What? Mississippi. Mississippi. No. <laughs> Judah and Benjamin. I ask about the southern kingdom because as we'll talk about later, the southern kingdom is where the Davidic line goes. And it follows through through the southern kingdom. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the northern kingdom and, and some of what was going on. All right, let's look at the giving of the law. As we said, there are 613 laws, which seems to us like a lot. You say, why, why so many laws? Um, because God is trying to form a nation that reflects the nature of God. Okay, He's brought a people out of Egypt that know nothing but pagan uh, worship, that know nothing but pagan laws and rules. I told you all last week, Right? I said, you know, there's this chapter in Leviticus that says, I said you might say, is that, is that really necessary? And the answer is yes, it was necessary for them. They are coming out of a culture that was, for lack of a better term, lawless in, in many ways. There were certainly laws around uh, civil order, but in terms of moral laws, in terms of being a light to other people, there were none, or, or very few. And so God is trying to form these people. And so he, he lists all these laws that says, okay, if you, if you defraud someone in this way, here's, here's the right way to, to go about making that right. If this happens, here's what you should do. If you don't want to fall into sin, don't do X, Y, and Z. Okay? So the law is given to them uh, in order to shape them. It was never meant to be and did not have the ability to be, as Paul tells us. Uh, it was never about being saved, right? It was never about, if you can just do all these laws perfectly, then you'll be right with God. That was never the point. God was trying to say to them, look, if you want to be, and the phrase I told you last week was that God repeats over and over again, be holy as I am holy. He says to that, that to them over and over again, be holy as I am holy. He says, if you want to be holy, this is what it looks like. Because they had no idea. He said, if you want to be holy, don't do X, Y, and Z. If you mess up, here's how you make it right. That's what the law is about. It's not about winning God's favor. It's not about, uh, you know, as I said, a checklist of if you've done, if you get... 430 of the laws, right, that you're good to go. It's, it's not, it doesn't work like that. It wasn't meant to work like that. It was meant to be a way for them to understand what God was calling them to and what God was calling them to be. So the law teaches them how to be. It teaches a second important lesson to them, and it is that where there is sin, there is death. We talked about that in Eden, right? The Adam and Eve were warned. If you, if you eat from that tree, you will die. God says the wages of sin are death. The Israelites learned this firsthand. We talked about the offerings and the sacrifices that are made. So uh, when, once the tabernacle is built, the altar and all that, and this ex extends to the temple uh, in that, that worship too. Twice a day, every day, morning and evening, you would have the burnt offering. And this was the most important of these offerings. It was the most regular. Along with the burnt offering would be a grain offering. Uh, the grain offering would include flour and salt and, and uh, frankincense and, and some other things. But the, the burnt offering 
was intended to be a reminder to the people of Israel that when you sin, there is a consequence. That something has to die. And if it's not going to be you, something has to die in your place. And so if it was your opportunity uh, to, to go and make this burnt offering, you took the best of your herd. Remember we talked about that, a three-year-old animal. So that's very specific why a three-year-old. A three-year-old is the most valuable piece of livestock. It's old enough that it's gotten past all those silly things that happen to young animals, the, the uh, deaths that young mothers have, having their first children, et cetera, et cetera. It's through all that. It's got nothing but its prime ahead of it. That's your most valuable animal. So you take your most valuable animal, it has to be completely unblemished. It can't have a limp. It can't have a funny spot where it shouldn't be. It can't have, you can kind of say, well, that one seems a little sickly. I'll take it. No. You take the best that you have to offer. You go to that altar. And you take this animal and you put it up on the altar and the priest is there with you. And you hold this animal down by its head while the priest reaches up and slits its throat. And you see the blood pour out and you feel the animal writhing in your hand. And it's meant to be exactly what it just was for you all. A horrible experience. It was meant to be a reminder to the people that sin has consequence. That sin is horrible. It's meant to remind you to avoid it at all cost. But what happens, as we as human beings are, are, are callous enough to do, it becomes something that just becomes rote becomes people going through the motions too often. They say, well, okay, if I need to, if I need to atone for, for my sin, I'll, I'll just run up there and do a burnt offering and we're good to go. There's a callousness that developed about it. That, and we see that uh, certainly in Jesus' time. Much of what he rails against in the sacrificial system is not about, it's not about the sacrifice being unpleasing to God. It's about the way it is being offered. It's lost the point. And the point was that sacrifice was supposed to be a horrible experience. It was supposed to remind you that you caused the death of this precious animal. And they would take this blood and they would splash it all over the front of the altar. And at certain sacrifices, uh, when they were doing uh, guilt offerings, sin offerings, they would take some of that blood and put it on the horns of the altar and put it around on everything so that everywhere you looked, there was the blood of this animal that had to give its life for your sin. And it's meant to be a reminder. The wages of sin are death. Steve? Why do they call it a burnt offering? A burnt offering because it would be burnt up completely. Not eaten. Not, the whole thing is burnt up as much, you know, bones and things obviously you can't, but all the flesh, all that would be burnt. So, the sacrifices to idols, oftentimes you set them on fire and when the barbecue was just right, then everybody would eat it and enjoy it. That was the that was the norm. Not so with this. You didn't take a bite of that. If you did, you would die. <coughs> or be put to death. It was it was considered a, an offering completely and wholly unto God. So as I said. There were five of these different offerings, this one being the most, most important. As I said, you could do sin offerings and guilt offerings, which were kind of for sometimes specific sins, but more often than not for kind of that vague sense that we all live in that we're not quite right with God. You know, and you, and you could go, this might be like our weekly confession kind of a thing, but, uh, but the burnt offering was the one that you typically think of. Uh, when you think of the sacrificial system. Um, so, for us, what we need to know about the law, what we need to take away from the law, is first and foremost, as I said, the wages of sin are death. And we see that. We see that in our own lives, in our own bodies. I said to you, in the garden, God intended for things to be in perfect harmony. Death, disease, all the stuff you all come in, oh, oh been in the hospital, I'm not feeling good. That's all sin. 
And it's not necessarily your sin. It's not, when I say that, I'm not saying you're a horrible person and God is visiting His retribution upon you. I'm saying sin is a part of our flesh. And it has broken our flesh. And it brings disease. And it brings death. And it brings all manner of horrible things into our lives. And pain and suffering. So forth and so on. But the wages of sin are death. The second thing you need to remember about the law is that it was intended to create a new people. To be a light to the nations. That's the other phrase. Be holy as I am holy and be a light to the nations. That was Israel's calling. That was what God put them there to do. It wasn't that God thought that they were particularly special. Remember I told you last week about Joshua. Remember that? He sees the commander of the Lord's armies coming towards him with a sword. And Joshua says, whose side are you on? And the commander of God's army says, neither. I'm on God's side. I'm not on Israel's side. I'm not on the Amorite's side. I'm on God's side. Israel was put there not because God loved them more than everyone else, not because they were particularly special, but because God had a special work for them to do in the world. They were meant to be a light to the nations so that the whole world could see what it looks like to live in right relationship with God. If you look in your packets, um, for those of you who have them, uh, you see that I, there's this map down here at the bottom. I'll just remind you all of this. I, I told you about this. This is this little bitty map, but... This map is incredibly important because all the dark part there is what's known as the Fertile Crescent. In that part of the world, that dark part is the only place you want to live. Okay? Over here we have Arabia, the desert. Like desert, desert. Not like, oh, the Southwest is lovely. No, like, there is nothing but sand, maybe a water and hole every so often, but a harsh, harsh place to live. They didn't even keep animals out there for most, most of the time. Uh, it, was a, it was a very harsh place to be. But up above you have Mesopotamia and Assyria or Syria. And then you have the little strip of land right there by the Mediterranean Sea that's Canaan. And then you go down to Egypt. What that meant was that every person who wanted to move anywhere in the ancient world from anywhere that mattered to anywhere else that mattered had to go through Israel. That's why God put them there. It's a very small chunk of land. It's like 300 miles long by 50 miles wide. Yeah. It's not nearly as big as Florida. It's the size of New Jersey. It's, I think Florida is like 10 times bigger. It is a very small piece of land, but a very important piece of land in the ancient world. And God put them right there because He said, I want the whole world to know what it looks like to be in relationship with me. That's your purpose. That's your point. And everything that we're going to talk about after this, all the failings, all the struggles, are when Israel fails to live up to that calling. That's the whole issue. So, Moses gives them the law. And he's out in the desert with him for 40 years. We talked about why all that was. We talked about he dies on Mount Nebo. He's buried. Now it's time for the Israelites to enter the promised land. And when you're talking about 3 million people, uh, so for instance, one day 3,000 die. Well, that's, that's a bloody horrible day, but statistically somewhat insignificant to the, to the, the question you're asking. But I, I, think, I think 2 million is, is a, a very reasonable number to, to think of. Across the Jordan. Across the Jordan, yeah. So, it's a big group. A real big group of people. But, it's not a huge group to hold a territory the size of what they're looking at. And they cross over the Jordan. And what's the first thing they do? Anybody remember? The first thing they do is get scared. The second thing they do is they start to drive out people in front of them. Uh, and God does it in all sorts of miraculous ways. And as a general rule, they don't have to do a whole lot of work. I mean, they have to show up. And, uh, you know, maybe 
they drive out 15,000 uh, Canaanites or whatever, and they've lost 15 men or something. I mean, the, the numbers are ridiculous when, when you read through all of this. Now, this is the period, too, though, where you see a number of the, we'll say, the stories that are really hard for us to hear. They're hard for us to deal with. The slaughters. Okay? Um, and, and while I don't have time to get into too much of that tonight, but uh, essentially, essentially the idea is that God is sending them into the land of people who, who Scripture describes as depraved. That these are people who have gone so far off off the radar that, uh, that God says, There's, I, I can't redeem this. We, we can't make this right. It's not unlike the, the situation that we see with Noah. God says, it's, it's gotten so bad that I can't do this. Now, from a theological standpoint, you have to start with this idea, again, that the wages of sin are death. Okay, And so... Any, every moment that you and I are here living in sin that God does not kill us is a moment of injustice. It's a moment of injustice. The just thing, in the purest sense of the word just, would be when we sin, we die. That is a just system. We don't live in a just system. We live in a merciful system. We live in a system of grace where God says, okay, I'm going to give you a chance to try to redeem yourself, to try to turn from your wickedness. Oh, it's not going to, it's going to get better, I promise. <laughs> no, I know you had a meeting you got to go to. Um, so, these slaughters and things, while they're not easy to digest and they're not easy to hear, and, and it's even more difficult sometimes to think about how, how does the God that we worship, this God of love that I keep talking about, how does God not only allow such things, but call for such things? And while this answer is not overly comforting or complete, it's essentially to say that God says, in order to accomplish what I need to accomplish, in order for me to uh, put this nation up as a light, for people to see, to actually have a chance to see what it's like to live in, in relationship with God, some of this other sinfulness has to has to be removed. It has to go away. The two cannot coexist. And as I said, that's not a very comforting answer. But it's all I've got for you. Okay? So Joshua brings them in. Joshua takes the place of Moses as the prophet. He's the one who's talking to God. He's listening to God. He's speaking for God. But he's also the general. He is also the head of the army. Moses never, uh, never took on that role, uh, but Joshua is, and this is Joshua leads them in and essentially clears most of what eventually becomes Israel. Now David will will do more, and David will unify the kingdom and do do all sorts of things, unify the tribes rather. Um, but most of this gets accomplished through Joshua by God. By God. So, after Joshua, you enter what's referred to as the time of the judges. And we talked about judges. There's debate about how many judges there were. Some will say there's 12. Some will say there's 15. It's irrelevant. The point being, this was a time where there was a singular person who led the Israelites. But who was king? Who was the king of Israel during the time of judges? Hmm? No, not Saul. God. God. So that is what God has set up in, in the desert with Moses, continues with Joshua, and right into the times of Judges, what we would call a theocracy, where God is supposed to be the king. God is supposed to be the ruler. He's speaking through Moses and Joshua and then later through the judges to say, Here, here's, my, here's my call. Here, here's what I would need you to know. And he keeps continually trying to draw the people back into right relationship with him. But this time of judges is a time of, of real downward spiral in terms of morality, but especially around idol worship. And idol worship, we saw it back in Exodus 32, right? Golden calf, we talked about that. All the way 
through the end of the Old Testament, the biggest issue for the nation of Israel was and continued to be idol worship. Idol worship. And we'll, we're going to talk more about that with the divided kingdom here in a minute. But um, we have this system uh, where there's the person in charge who is speaking on behalf of God and Israel is, is called to listen to him. Now the judge was in charge of everything. Prophet, military leader, religious leader, political leader. They were, you know, the, the grand dictator, uh, for lack, lack of a better term. But they were meant to be a servant. They were meant to be a servant of God. And God even talks to them about this. It's in, I want to say Exodus 17 or something like that. God talks to Israel about what it will be like for them to have a king. And uh, he says to them, you know, this king needs to be a servant. It needs to be someone who will listen to me. Uh, it goes on and on and tells them what it's like. And that's what this judge was supposed to be. Not a king like we think of it, lording it over people. But rather, a servant of God. And so, you get this period of judges. And we, we're not going to get bogged down too much in that. Um, but it comes down to Samuel. Okay, so Samuel is the last judge. And the people come to Samuel, uh, I believe chapter 8, and they say to Samuel, we want a king like the other nations. Did I see a problem there? Israel was not supposed to be like the other nations. As I said, it wasn't necessarily that they wanted a king because God's already talked to them about what it, what it might be like to have a king. But he said, we want a king like the other nations. Someone to lead us into battle. Someone to lord over us. And Samuel goes to God and he's all kinds of upset. He says, I can't believe they're asking for this. What, what do you want me to do? And God says to Samuel, look, I've been dealing with these people for a long time. <laughs> don't worry about it. I understand your frustration, but don't give it another thought. This is how they are. This is my interpretation of the conversation. <laughs> That's basically how it goes. And... Uh, he says to Samuel, if they want a king, we'll give them a king. But, but, he says, you need to let them know what it's going to be like. And so Samuel goes back to him and says, if you want a king, here's what's going to happen. That king is going to, um, that king is going to uh, take the best of your stuff. He's going to take the best of your crops and your animals. He's going to take your sons and daughters and they're going to have to be courtiers and chariotsmen. And it goes on and on. And, and the, the big finale, some of you will get a kick out of this, but the big finale that he says to him, and look, if you have a king, he's going to tax you up to 10% of what you have. Anybody want to sign up for 10%? Yeah. But that's like his big, he's going, they're going to take 10% of all that you have. And the people's response is, bring it on. That's exactly what we want. So God says, okay. God says, okay. And he calls Saul. And Samuel goes and anoints Saul. And for the most part, so we said the three kings were Saul, David, and Solomon. For the most part, these are three kings that, as I said, for the most part, did what God called them to do. They each had their own struggles, their own problems, but this was a time of great revival in Israel. And Israel reaches by far its high point. By far in terms of land mass, in terms of, 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 uh, in terms of religious fervor, in terms of economic and uh, spiritual growth, etc. In almost every facet that you could measure, this is Israel's high point. And it really happens the end of David, end of Solomon's life into Solomon's reign. It's only a hundred year period. After this, these three kings, everything is downhill. Big time. Big time. But it's under these three kings that seek to be servants of God that Israel thrives. So, God grants them what they ask for. But He tries to work with His prophet to to um, to create a, a, a servant king. To create a servant king. And things go pretty well, as I said, 
under those servant kings. Now, as you all know, Saul didn't do what God asked him to do. God removes him from the throne, anoints a little kid named David who sits on the throne for 40 years, and then his son Solomon sits on the throne. Now, God makes a promise, a covenant with David, that his throne will uh, remain forever. That someone will sit on the seat of his throne for all of eternity. And so we see that to Solomon. And then after Solomon's life, so Solomon started taxing the people a, a little bit heavily, and, and the people weren't too happy about it. But the kingdom was still united, and things were going pretty well. But when Solomon dies, Solomon's son Rehoboam comes along. And the people come to Rehoboam and say, you know, we'd really like for you to lower these taxes a little. It's a little bit oppressive. And Rehoboam is young. He has his young advisors all around him. And of course his young advisors say, no, don't raise their taxes. Stick it to them. Show them who's boss. And so that's what Rehoboam does. He goes to him and says, you know, I'm going to double your taxes. And you should have an alternative to this. But remember, God has made a covenant with David. Someone in his line will sit on the throne forever. Jeroboam is not a member of David's family, but Jeroboam wants to be the king. And so, essentially, that's when civil war breaks out. You get the ten tribes to the north who follow Jeroboam, the two tribes to the south that stay with Rehoboam, and continue David's line. Now, we're about to run out of time here. Um, I'm going to leave you with a, a bit of a cliffhanger here because these two kings, are, or these two kings' lines, I guess I should say, share an awful lot in common. They do a lot of horrible things. And they pay the price for it. And the biggest price that they pay, the reminder uh, to each of us, is that sin can wreck your life. Sin can wreck your life. That shouldn't be news to anyone. I suspect we've all seen that, maybe in ourselves and others. Sin can wreck your life, and we will see that play out in spectacular ways. In spectacular ways in these two kingdoms. But we'll also see, as I said last week or the week before, a God who is faithful to those who are unfaithful. A God who will continue to call these people back over and over and over again. A God who will continue to be faithful to the promises God has made, even though His people are unfaithful in return. Okay? Alright. We'll pick that up next week then with the divided kingdom. Thank you.